And we are live. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. Glad to have everyone with us this morning. And welcome to the meeting today for Upper Thames River Conservation Authority Board of Directors for October the 26th. Um, just a few quick notes again, as usual. Reminder that uh, Chris Harrington is acting as our host. Uh, if you have any connection issues or any problems, um, try to get a hold of Chris through the chat feature. Uh, we're trying to keep everybody in the meeting. Um, please remember to uh, mute your microphone if you're not speaking, and that way we can uh, avoid any background uh, noise and, and feedback. Uh, have your participant and chat windows open, and uh, if you got the raised feature, raised, raised hand feature, please use it. Otherwise, uh, make sure you you wave your hand or speak up, and we'll try to make sure we uh, we get everybody and keep them in the meeting. Also a reminder that today's meeting is being recorded and live streamed on our YouTube channel as part of our requirement to allow public viewing of the proceedings. And our First Nation territorial greeting. We will begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, the Anishabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Luwanapiek peoples who have a long-standing relationship to the land, water, and region of Southwestern Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, the United Nation of the Thames, Muncie Delaware Nation, and Delaware Nation at Moravian Town. In the region, there are 11 First Nation communities and a growing indigenous urban population. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all the original peoples of Turtle Island. And I'm say I think the only regrets we have is Tony. I think Tony might not be able to join us this morning. He's on the road today, but um, with that, I'll ask Michelle to do the roll call, please. Mary Blosh. Present. Alan Dale. Present. Anna Hopkins. Here. Uh, Tony Jackson sent his regrets. Uh, Sandy Levin. Here. Margaret Lupton. Here. Nancy Manning. Here. Hugh McDermott. Here. Paul Mitchell. Present. Anna Marie Murray. We have Anna Marie. Was here. See Anna Marie. Maybe yeah, I'm she, seeing her there. Notice she's <laughs> muted. I've hit she the might button. Be muted. Yeah. She looks maybe even a little frozen. Okay. We'll come back to her. Uh, Brian Petrie. Here. Jim Reffel. Here. Joe Salter. Here. Mark Schadenberg. Here. Alex Westman. Here. Here. Is that Anna Anna Marie? Marie? I'm yes, I'm here. There we Internet go. Internet problems, I think. So yeah, that's that's good. We're glad you're still with us there, Anna Thank Marie. You. Okay, so we've got 14 board members present. So that's great. Um, first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. And if I can get Anna Marie to move that and Brian to second it, please. I so move. And second it. Good. Thank you. Any comments or questions at all on the uh, <coughs> on the motion to approve the agenda? I'm not seeing or hearing anything. So with that, I'll call for the vote. And Michelle, if you could do the roll call, please. Marie Blosh. Yes. Alan Dale. Yes. Anna Hopkins. Yes. Sandy Levin. Yes. Margaret Lupton. Yes. Nancy Manning. Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? <clears throat> Anna Marie? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. So. Uh, Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Ruffel? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, so that's carried, thank you. 
Um, second item, any declarations of conflicts of interest for today's meeting? Anything from any of the board members? If not, uh, item number three is the minutes of the previous meeting. And that was dated on September the 28th of 2021. Uh, if I could get Jim to move that please and Joe to second it. So moved. I'll second that. Good, thank you. Any comments or questions, errors or omissions, anything on the minutes for September the 28th? I'm not seeing or hearing anything, so I'll call for the vote on the motion. Uh, Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Murray Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Raffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried, thank you. Item number four, I don't believe there's any business arising from those minutes. We have no delegations for today's meeting. So that takes us right down to business for approval. And the first one is 6.1. Uh, it's a look at the 2022 draft budget. And um, we'll get some high level comments here from staff and uh, open up for a few questions. So uh, first of all, can I get Mark to, uh, to move this report and Alex to second it, please? I shall move it, yes. And I second it. Good, thank you. Okay, so yes, yeah, so we're still a uh, long ways to go to February. This is a, a real first view at the, uh, the budget. We're still pretty high level here. Um, but I'll turn it over to Tracy and uh, to Christine to uh, give us some more updates on this report. Okay, thank you, Alan, through the chair. Just again, wanted to emphasize this is this is a draft budget. Uh, Christine's great for reminding me that yes, this is still early on in the year. There's still lots of uncertainty as uh, we progress through different applications for funding, um, et cetera. But uh, we're getting something down for now so that we can continue to work on it, improve upon it. One of the most recent changes that are most notable are the uh, provincial requirements with the regulations coming out. Uh, a few components uh, that we were aware of, which included the watershed-based uh, resource and management strategy, and we were also aware to anticipate uh, an inventory of our, of our lands and our conservation areas. Uh, a couple items that weren't anticipated that we're still trying to figure out what and how much work is going to need to complete were the Natural Hazards Infrastructure Operations Management Plan, as well as the Natural Hazards Infrastructure Asset Management Plan. So uh, both the operations and assets there, um, of course we have some, some information on that, but we're really uncertain about what, what uh, level of detail is going to be required uh, to submit to the province in the future. Of course, uh, with most things with the province, uh, they haven't indicated any additional funding to undertake this work, uh, nor have they indicated if they'll be reinstating some of the cuts that happened a couple of years ago. Um, so, of course, we have planned reserves that we're intending to use for both, um, both flood control operations and, uh, or, uh, and also our parks program. Um, and, and those are two areas where we do have dedicated reserve funds. Um, we always set some money aside to, to plan out uh, future works in those areas. Um, the budget also contains certain requirements in order to maintain our level of service, but at the same time, we have some uncontrollable expenses. You noted that insurance rates, uh, we have a figure now that we've plugged in, which is 22%. Um, that's pretty significant. Um, and also the consumer price index. Uh, I know there's, it's been in the news again last week, um, this is record high uh, when we're talking about CPI um, and uh, depending on um, the supply chain, uh, it's, it's forecasted to continue for some time as well. Uh, so really uncertain when that will stabilize. I know the goal is always around two, but uh, that's not what we're experiencing right now. Um, so those are some, some high level comments. Again, uh, there's work, some work anticipated in here. Um, 
for items that we we're aware of as we were drafting the budget, the release of the regulations, there's still some, some work that needs to be done to, to sort out some of the additional um, staff time and work plans for those areas that were not anticipated. Um, again, we'll, we'll have to do that work to comply with the new regulations. So um, with that, I think I'll just uh, pass it over to Christine to see if she has anything else that she'd like to add. video on. There we go. There you are. Um, I know. I'm like, I, I can hear you, but I can't see you, Christine. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I started it without. Um, so uh, Tracy mentioned, yeah, we, we've given you this year a um, combined picture of operating and capital spending as planned. And uh, because we are I guess we're concerned about the types of expenses and how those costs might change. This budget this year um, shows the expenditure not by unit, but rather by type of expenditure. Um, that's not actually how it's presented in our annual financial statements, but for working purposes, it became important to see what categories of expenses were changing more than say others. So for us, this is a, this is a working document. Um, and very clearly you can see the biggest type of expense is wages. Um, the the headcount that goes with this budget is, uh, where's my number? Um, 139.82 bodies, FTEs. And I actually spent some time looking back over the last number of budgets that we've presented to the board um, since the fall of 2020, our very first crack at 2021 budget. Um, and it was 128.8. They go up and down. Almost every iteration of budget we have, we not almost every iteration of budget we have, we go through the staffing worksheet in um, significant detail. And the numbers have been fluctuating as much as eight, eight people from or FTEs from budget to budget. So uh, we break it down into two decimals and try and refine the portion of the year that we expect somebody to, to be employed. But as Tracy was saying, it's, uh, it's a challenge right now. Um, with luck, we'll get it closer by February. Um, I, that's one thing because it's the biggest category I, I did want to mention. Um, and I suppose questions are coming. So we'll, we'll try to answer those for you. Okay, thank you. Hands. Um, so yes, we'll go down to some questions here. And um, I've got Paul here first, Paul. So, Are you there, Paul? Sandy was ahead of me, so I'll defer to him. Oh, okay. Um, Sandy? Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, just uh, before we get too deep in this, I was looking to make an amendment already that we approved the budget, though, with a 3.1 increase, 3.1 increase in the operating levy for discussion with member municipalities. Noting that that'll require a reduction of 200,000 in the levy shown in the budget presented in the agenda. And of course, final budget approvals considered at the AGM. It, to me, it's irrelevant whether that comes from upping the revenue estimates or reducing the expenses. But the concern I have, and I recognize the budget is fluid until we approve it in February, but we're going out to the municipalities before that. And frankly, the municipalities look at the change in the levy and react to it. And uh, between some of the, the uh, you know, responses we've gotten in the past, I think if we go with what's in the current budget is not going to be received well, uh, not going to be accepted, it's going to be challenged, et cetera. But I think 
if we go in with a little more cautious of an increase, uh, and again, I'm suggesting 3.1, which is a $200,000 change, uh, I think we're going to be in a better place. And certainly between now and February, there'll be additional information for us to deal with. And, uh, you know, uh, I think we're better off with this amendment. So hopefully somebody will second it as we carry on the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so let's, let's deal with this right now then. Does somebody like to second that amendment from Sandy? I'll, I'll second it because uh, I'm not quite sure where Sandy's coming from, but I would like to discuss it more. So for the sake okay. of having it on the floor, I'll second it. So Paul's gonna second that, okay. Um, so Paul, you were, you were next. Do you wanna to speak to this amendment or you have some other questions on the budget? No, I have other questions and I'll, I'll just hold them till we, uh, till we deal with this amendment first. Okay. Um, other hands here, I've got Anna. Anna, go ahead. Yeah, so are we on the amendment right now? I do have a number of questions. Yeah, we should, but... uh, we, we oh. should deal with this amendment. Um, you know, this is obviously going to, uh, we're either, either gonna go down one road or we're gonna have a more general discussion. But if, you know, the direction is to, to right now, uh, um, you know, Alan, if it's cool. easier, I'll withdraw the motion and we, I could move it later if that's better. If, if I may. Um, Go ahead, Anna. Mr. Chair, just I, I think that would be better because for me, I've got a number of questions. I am interested in uh, Sandy's motion to reduce the, the levy, but uh, for now, I, I have a number of outstanding questions. Okay. So why don't we just, we'll, we'll just, Park the amendment for a second. Um, if some people have some high level questions about the budget in general, let's deal with those now. Um, we don't need to get down into the weeds right at this point and real specific stuff. Um, and we don't need to have a whole lot of discussion about you know reducing the levy because we know we've already got this amendment here on the side that uh, we'll come back to. Okay, so let me, let me just put that amendment to the side for a moment. And I'll go back to Paul first and I'll come to Anna and we'll just deal with some general questions here on the report. So go ahead, Paul. Okay, I have three questions uh, through you, Mr. Chair. And first one is, do you anticipate the need to hire additional staff to do the work outline regarding the Conservation Authorities Act phase one regulations? Okay, so Tracy, do you wanna tackle that one? Sure, I guess the short answer is yes, through the chair. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we're still working on what that work plan looks like for um, some of the new items, for sure, that uh, were just added last week. So. Okay, uh, my second question is, if I remember last year about this time, we were, there was a little bit of confusion about how current the CVA data was and uh, Impact um, put their general assessment property on hold for 20 and 2021 due to COVID. So I just, the, the numbers that are punched in there for 2020 and 2021 in the chart, how current are those numbers? What, what years do where they come from? Sure, I can through the chair. Um, we get uh, a spreadsheet directed straight from the MECP uh, for our use. And um, they, the CBA is calculated on the population um, that was province-wide enumeration from 2020. Now, MPAC did say that uh, they were delaying some assessments um, for 2020 and 2021. However, we have noticed with some of our own properties, um, they've been uh, reevaluated by MPAC and we have updated assessments. So um, can't quite specifically say where and when those uh, assessments happen throughout the province, but we are certainly in line with um, what uh, the MECP has provided us and uh, consistent with our levy regulation as well. Uh, Christine might have some more to add. On that score, no. Um, we did see changes in our own assessments this year. Um, I believe having read the impact site in 2020, they, they simply were saying, we're not going to increase assessments 
um, on what they sent to municipalities. Therefore, municipalities should be holding the line on property tax charges. Um, but no, to, MPAC continues to work, continues to update their data. Um, and so we have population and uh, size data that's 2020. And that's what is distributed through MNRF, MECP actually, um, to us. Okay. It, it changes every single year. Yeah, okay. So yeah, the, the data is uh, primarily based on on uh, property sales, not so much as across the board reassessment, but the data that we've got is the most current that we can get. Yep. Okay, that's good. Uh, and my last question is, uh, when will the salary review be completed and does the 12% increase in wages, benefits, and per diems reflect the expected results of the review? Yes, if I can through the chair. Um, we applied a 5% estimate uh, for the uh, compensation review uh, applied across the entire grid. We're anticipating to have that review completed by the end of the year. Um, and then we'll be able to more accurately um, apply to which job rates, which positions. Again, uh, really, really uh, don't have a crystal ball right now to anticipate those outcomes, but uh, we did apply a certain amount. Um, and also rec recognize that 12% uh, also was benefits. We, we have changed benefit providers and they always provide a little bit of a, an incentive for signing on initially and then rates progress uh, in the subsequent years. Um, and uh, also the FTE component that uh, Christine was talking about is all part of that 12%. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great, thanks Paul. Um, Anna, we'll go back to you now. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to staff for this uh, draft budget conversation. I know we're in the early stages uh, now, so that's important to, to make note of that. Things uh, I appreciate what Christine said about uh, costs may change. I do have my first question is around the uh, discussions with municipalities. And how will that be undertaken? I know in the past, uh, we've gone to council. I'm a little un unclear as to, well, I think this year is very unclear for a number of reasons. We really don't know what the next stage of regulations are. We know we're coming out of uh, COVID and, and the challenges remain. We know the, the challenges that CAs have been under through COVID as well. And, and so there's a lot of things going on and, and I think it is important that municipalities understand CAs and their position. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just a question around how that process will look like if, if we know right now. Okay, Tracy. Sure, uh, if I can through the chair. Um, I've had some very initial discussions with uh, some of the CAOs and some of our municipalities, Christine, myself and, and uh, our counterparts at the Lower Thames and Kettle Creek uh, have met with the City of London as well. Um, lots of questions that uh, most are asking about are also the regulations and where we're standing at with regulation and knowing that there's also a levy regulation to come as well. So um, was hoping to get a little bit more information because uh, lots, lots of more further questions. Again, it's exactly what you're suggesting, Anna, knowing that there's changes in progress and, and what those mean. Um, but the intent would be to, uh, uh, again, follow up with senior staff, another touch base point, update about regulations and timelines. Um, and those have changed as well, as you saw in the report later on the agenda package today. But uh, first have those discussions and some, again, preliminary in, input from, from senior staff and then the offer to go out to, to councils. Um, I know last year, again, it was a, a low increase that was proposed. Um, not many councils chose for the full presentation, instead uh, just opted to, to receive a report, but uh, who knows with those changes to uh, the CA Act, there may be uh, more of a desire, but that's to gauge the preliminary uh, feedback from those senior staff members to know uh, what approach their municipality would like moving forward as we as we uh, further refine our budget and timing. And some prefer uh, budget discussions earlier, uh, others um, wait till uh, until uh, even after an AGM to 
depending on their level of uh, interest and concern. So. Christine, if you have anything else, certainly jump in. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Anna, any more questions? Well, it looks like she's Anna, frozen. Are you? Yeah, she looks frozen on my screen. We may have lost Anna. Well, there's Anna. Oh, no. Yep. Am I back? You're back, yes. Oh. Any, any follow up? Yeah. Well, uh, these are unusual times for CAs given the, the number of um, regulations that we're still not sure of. But I think it's really important that we communicate with municipalities and really would encourage staff to do that. I am having difficulty, Mr. Chair, with my internet this morning. So uh, just holler and hopefully I'll um, be okay. I do have a second question and it is regarding the, the wages. And thank you, Christine, for um, um, making me aware of that. Uh, you know, we, we still have a review and there's still more work to be done. But my question is around the 5% and why that number was, um, was was used uh, for now. Christine? Actually, I'm gonna let Tracy tackle that one because <laughs> it was bandied, <laughs> bandied about quite heavily, that number. <laughs> okay, I'll go to Christy, or oh, sorry, I'll go to Tracy. <laughs> sure. Um, again, it was uh, a recommendation from our HR department uh, who had undertaken some, some very high level estimates uh, based on some early early consultation with other CAs, just gauging um, some of the salaries um, with similar titles. Again, it didn't go into job descriptions and level of responsibilities. It was just kind of a, a title by title. They have matching titles. This is kind of where we, we land. So again, very high, high level review. And I uh, thought we, we know that that's a, a an additional cost that we're anticipating, wanted to incorporate it into our budget process at this point and know that it will be refined as the results of the, the full compensation review. Again, we're looking at a full compensation review, not just salary, that's certainly a component, but uh, more information will be coming. Thank you for that. That's good to know that you've consulted with, well, reached out to other CAs and, and, and doing those comparisons and are more to come. I know that 5% is a large number in the municipality of London when it comes to wages increases throughout our staff. So I, um, I'm looking forward to that complete review coming forward. I am very supportive of deferring the new funding. I think that the challenge is going to be with the regulations that are to come that we're still unsure of and interested in hearing more about uh, the amended motion coming from uh, Sandy as I, I, I do agree given um, that we may not be, we, we really should be open and uh, to, to the challenges and the changes that are to come and looking forward to hearing other board members' comments as well. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, Mark, you're next. Yeah, I guess just a, a general question. I noticed on the 2022 budget page for revenues and expenses, just about all the revenues and expenses, say for example, conservation services and conservation areas and whatnot are just about uh, equal at, uh, very little deficit, for example, projected. Is, is that part of the problem to make it make it cost cost uh, return revenues on, on all those? Um, uh, for example, the one even environmental planning and regulations, the numbers are almost identical between revenues and expenses to make it all sort of cost recovery uh, on, on those and get the close to zero as possible. Christine, I see you nodding. I'll let you uh, tackle that. So, the description by um, unit there um, does give an idea of what the, the summary picture looks like broken out by unit. Clearly in environmental planning and regs, um, we can do some cost recovery because most of the revenues aside from levy are, are fee related for permitting and planning and review. Um, if we were to have a balanced budget 
across the organization, we might be able to see close to zero numbers there. No, no surplus, no deficit at each unit. But one thing that is in these figures is the uh, question of how best to distribute the levy among all the activities of the units. And that uh, formula, it needs work. Um, we, we have been using a formula based on the ability of a certain unit to find funding or secure funding outside of levy if, if there is a user fee portion to what goes on in that unit. Um, then, then they have a, a lower need for levy contribution. Uh, but over the last three or four years, that formula has not been proving to be uh, equitable. And so what you're seeing here is uh, levy being dis distributed across units and therefore revenues changing in a in a somewhat arbitrary fashion. So uh, when you see, so you see water and information management is projecting a deficit. That's pretty typical. Uh, it often appears that way. Environmental planning and regs usually can produce a balanced um, outcome at the end of the year. And we have incorporated a quite a significant expectation of fee changes there. Um, conservation services, this in my experience is a small deficit for conservation services. Usually they run a surplus. Um, so perhaps uh, we need to look at that budget in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so the results of surpluses and deficits by unit is as accurate as we can get it based on the formulas that we use for how we distribute the levy. Um, and these results here, what I'm seeing are more bracketed figures now than we have in previous years in more units across the organization. So it's um, the pressure is being felt in every part of the organization where perhaps five years ago, it was a little bit more focused. That's kind of what I'm seeing. Does that okay. answer the question? Any, any follow-up, Mark, or? No, I'm good to go. Okay. Okay, that's good, thank you. Um, other questions or comments on the report? Alan, I see Hugh's hand. Hugh, go, go ahead. Um, just on the assessment, uh, they came to our last Perth County meeting impact and basically they're using 2016 data to figure things out and they will do uh, update assessments, but uh, not quite for this organization, but for uh, rural municipalities, uh, that's very bad because the uh, impact between farmland and houses, it hasn't been evened out again. Um, and if anybody wants, uh, they gave quite a... Uh, a talk at our county meeting, if anybody ever wants to go and look at that. When it comes to CPI, uh, the best thing you could do is make sure that everybody understands uh, what dates you're using. Like at uh, Perth East and Perth County, ours came out at 1.245. So, but you use a different timeline than we do. So you'd probably be very well to make sure everybody understands what that timeline is, because that's why everybody's gonna have something different. So yours could easily be 3% and ours could be 1.25, just different timelines. So I'd make sure that everybody understands your timeline. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Yep. Well, that's, that's good. Thanks, Hugh. Because, yeah, we're, we're trying to get the latest information we can, and but uh, it's not easy and not everybody's able to, to use the same figures. So that's, that's true. Okay. Other comments and questions? I'm not uh, seeing any hands or in there. So let's, let's go back to the amendment then. Um, the original report was looking at, uh, or this version of the, the budget, this report was looking at a, an average 6.6% .6 increase in the levy. Um, we have an amendment on, we'll put back on the floor now. And that's moved by Sandy and second by Paul that we're gonna ask staff to go back and trim 
$200,000 from the municipal levy and take it down to an average of 3.1%, I believe. So, um, comments and questions, Sandy and Paul, you've mentioned this. I don't know if you have either one of you have any comments before I open it up to everyone else. No, go ahead and let uh, everybody else speak to it. I'm happy to wrap up. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, I see Brian. Brian, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you. Um, when I look at a budget, it, uh, I always look at it, whether it's good news or bad news, whether it's justifiable in what we're trying to do and, and the goals. And this one, uh, there's always room for change and there's going to be change in this budget as we get numbers because it's very early, whether staff get funding and, and that can replace some levy and hopefully it can. But I want to thank you for putting this table because it's going to be time to think about Sandy's motion and, and then come up with some thoughts on it. So we've had some extremely tight budgets, tighter budgets than usual over the last couple of years of the pandemic. And of course, as there's been, it's like with everything that's happened in the pandemic, this has built pent up demand within our system. Of, and, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing increase in staff and come back. That's going to increase the budget. That's justifiable because staff has been reduced. Um, we're seeing the regulation changes. That's that's creating, whether it was the, out, the desired outcome of the municipalities asking for it or the, uh, the, the, the government when putting in these regs, that's increasing the amount of work that staff has to do, which then therefore is going to have to be funded somehow. And uh, that's going to increase the amount of money that's need to be spent. So that's, that's justifiable. That makes sense to me. There's the externalities, the insurance level. That's affecting everybody and it's out of everybody's control that needs to be addressed at the provincial level but again that's out of our control we have to have insurance that's going to raise cost um, inflation we're seeing that with the cpi that's out of our control even if we don't raise wages we're going to have that material cost we're going to have that in uh, everything else or shortages which are increasing staff shortages if we don't I've toyed around with the, the number for a 5% increase in staff. And then we have the, the wage review coming through. And my conclusion is if that we don't do this, what we're going to see with the amount of inflation out in the, in the economy and, and the real price of houses and gas and everything, we're going to see an upswell of all workers wanting more money because they're going to need more money. And it's going to be a very competitive market out there where staff is going to be able to go out and, and possibly get, I want to retain staff and I want to make sure they're taken care of and they're able to uh, have a, a life. I think we have responsibility to treat uh, people like that. And then it, what it always comes down to is people asking for things and not wanting to pay for them. And I'm going to target the provincial government on this one. They cut our funding by 50%, which was inadequate to begin with. It was based off 20 year, 20 year old numbers that probably weren't adequate then. They've now put all these regs on the UTRCA and all, all authorities for change, which, which causes money to be, have to be spent because you're not doing the same thing. You have to reorganize things and then you have no more funding coming forward. So that has to come from somewhere. And unfortunately, the way the government has set this up is most of it comes from municipalities. Um, so I, 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 I always encourage staff, and I know they will, to go back and look at this. And um, again, I remember the municipalities put forward ideas, ideas, but where do we get this money from and what do we want to cut? Because uh, this is a plan of what we want to do. What don't we want to do to get that money, to, do, to, do, to, to save that money? Um, $200,000, I know we have a huge budget, so it doesn't seem like a lot, but when it, adding up everything... It is a lot of money. So I'll put that out there for, for conversation as well. Um, I'd love to hear from staff if they've, they think they can do it. Um, I know they can do it because we can just, you know, you have to do it. But is there areas where they think there's, there, there's areas for improvement? Do they see more increased revenues, like Sandy had said? 
are we being very conservative on our revenues? Like I know we usually are in the past when it comes to funding. Um, I'd love to hear for staff on that perspective. Okay. And yeah, you're, you're right. Um, in the, in the, certainly in the short term, this whole um, exercise the province is putting us through is going to cause us a lot of uh, increased costs to uh, uh, do these inventories and sort everything out. It's going to be a lot of staff time. And I, I certainly believe that the, you know, the province did cut the, the, um, the flooding uh, funding by 50%. Um, they are making things mandatory, but they are, they are removing themselves from being the funding partners. So it's, uh, it's going to fall on municipalities and it's, it's downloading. Um, but unfortunately that's what we're, we're faced with here. I'll turn it over to Tracy and to um, Christine to talk about uh, um, your questions regarding the 200,000, whether we are, how achievable that is and whether we should be uh, a little more uh, generous with our revenue estimates and, and how we're going to tackle this. So um, Tracy, you want to go first or just Christine? Sure. Or? Sure, if I can through the chair and thank you for the, the questions and the discussion because yeah, much as this is the same conversations that we've had as managers as well. And I would say managers in each department tend to be a bit more conservative, especially at this age stage in the game, um, knowing that yeah, there is a lot of level of uncertainty uh, at this point. Um, to know even if you know, getting the 200,000 will be enough. Um, as I said, there's certain aspects of what the province is requiring that we really haven't put work plans together to know how much additional staff time and what will be required to complete uh, and, and to ultimately conform with those regulatory changes. Um, yeah, we feel that there's a lot of items in this budget that are uncontrolled expenses. Um, as you mentioned, insurance. Um, the consumer price index. We use April over April, which is giving us a high number. Um, so those are, those are some of the challenges that we're faced at this time. Um, certainly we're looking for, for some direction from the board through presenting this budget so you can understand some of the challenges that we do have. Um, uh, but uh, certainly I'll pass it over to, to Christine to see if she has any additional thoughts as well. Um. In terms of revenue estimates, um, they may be a little conservative. I don't get the impression that they're very conservative. Um, it's just we, we do not know at this time what kind of grants might become available next April to, to fit into this budget. Um, if we can continue with a conservative government, we, we might be able to estimate. Um, but, it, but it's very, very, very hard to predict that far in advance what other funding sources there may be. Um, I, I think you have to speak with the managers of the programs about the costs that they've worked in here. Um, again, we go back to staffing because it is the largest component of, of our kind of expenses. And uh, those are the managers who, who sat down and they say, I need 10.15 FTEs or I need 42 over here in the parks. They're, they set those, those, those staffing levels based on the activities that, that they're being asked to, to deliver. Um, I just wanna mention uh, that this, this is a deficit budget already with the 6.6% levy. And this budget would have us deplete our 7 million rough dollars of reserves by a million dollars already. So if, if expense costs are what's uh, driving this deficit or a large part of what is driving the deficit and the expenses cannot be better controlled uh, then cutting your funding would simply make that deficit even worse. So, um, I, as I say, I'm seeing more and more pressure on the levy as other funding sources decline. Interest rates are 
significantly lower now than they were uh, three years ago. Donations are down uh, as well. So um, we have to get very creative in order to accommodate this $700,000 deficit as it is, uh, because this organization cannot run $700,000 deficits for very many years in a row. And we had no uh, wage subsidies. We, we experienced no benefit from the federal government during COVID. Um, and I believe that also has an impact on, um, on the figures. Uh, and I would have expected that municipalities that did get emergency funding or, or wage subsidies um, are actually better, better able to afford uh, some things than we are at this point. So um, yeah. revenue estimates are, are, are tricky. Expense estimates are also tricky. Um, I'm hoping that we will get some better figures for the, for the salary review and can make some, make some impact against this deficit budget by, uh, through that. Um, yeah, I, uh, some, of your, some of the other managers Tracy might be able to comment on the revenue estimates better than I. Well, and I certainly know with the, the CAs, um, usually in November is when we bring a, a fees update to the board um, that discusses all of our fees. Um, it's been mentioned that environmental planning has already made some estimates for some fairly significant fees hikes, um, but the CAs will also have to um, look at their revenue in the parks. Um, so, it certainly might improve the bottom line, um, but uh, yes, if uh, any of the managers have anything else to add. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, if I can for a minute, just on the comment around um, ability to generate revenue and specifically in our unit, that capacity usually comes from the opportunity to pursue grants and um, you know, funding programs to take on projects. So we always refer to that as soft revenue. So we start the year with the hopes of kind of um, taking things that we've looked at when we put together our strategic plan, for example, and in kind of developing our strategic plan, we thought about things partners would want to do and partner with us to work on. My worry and my challenge and maybe why being conservative this year is a little more realistic is now we have a list of things in the regulations we're going to need to do and our capacity now to go out and take on projects that align with our strategic plans and the partners we typically work from, we're going to have staff dedicated on developing things that are in the regulation. I don't anticipate being able to fundraise on things we're being mandated to do in the regulation from the province. So I'm conservative and we usually do better than what we start, what my unit budget looks like at the start of the year, but I feel being conservative this year is more appropriate than others. Okay. Yeah, it's certainly, um, to say in the short term, it's gonna be really, we've got a lot of work to do and it's gonna take a lot of uh, uh, staff time and, and resources, that's for certain. Any one else? I think we're. I think we all we got understanding. Chris Tasker is off mute, so I think Chris Tasker would like to add. Okay. Yeah. If I if Chris. I may just add, add to what Chris Harrington uh, indicated, uh, the water management that's our flood control program has run a deficit year over over year. This is a it, it's it's a challenge, and our only source of revenue for that program, short of federal funding from NDMP has been through through levy other than for our capital projects where we where we have some 50% uh, funding so levy is the only source of revenue really that 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 we can rely on for for a lot of these things so going out and finding more revenue um, really isn't an option for us it's a matter of uh, being able to continue to prov pr provide those programs which um, which were manda mandated to do, actually. Okay, okay, good to know. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else there right now. So any follow-up at all then, Brian? Yeah, I want to thank staff for... That's, that's the thing. I love, our, I love our staff, I love any staff, because they're dealing with this every day. So they, they, they know... I feel very confident that our staff is competent in what they're putting forward. 
And that's very important. They, they were able just to justify it just like that. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. We were, we're taking, we've been told we have to do this, which is going to cost money instead of projects that staff usually do to go out to find revenue uh, to help the gen, help um, offset the, the levy. So that's, that's going to raise the levy. That's, that's a clear one for the other there. Um, that's concerning. I think the... Oh, we've, we've, you're frozen, Brian. Okay, we seem to have lost Brian there for a minute. Um, let's move on. I've got a couple other hands here. So, uh, Paul, are you there? You're next. Yeah, I, I just want to make it clear that I seconded this motion, not necessarily because I support it, but I think it's really important that the, the board has this opportunity to discuss it among ourselves and, and with senior staff at this early point. And I wanted to make sure that that the amendment got on the table. So that's that's why I brought it forward. I I understand where Sandy's coming from. 3.1 is close to what we did last year at 3% on increase, 6.6. .6. Sounds like a big number. Part of the problem when you come in with a low number is that people tend to expect that that's the norm um, and that it's gonna be a low number uh, going forward. But I, I hesitate to tie staff's hands to a 3.1 because from what I'm hearing, they've been very conservative on, on all their estimates and, and we have um, the increases in insurance and, and other things that are beyond our control. But to me, the, the big wild card is inflation. We're looking at 4.4, I think at the latest CPI. So I was glad to see them go up from, I think, 3.7 to 5% in inflation, because that has such a huge impact on our largest expense, which is wages and salaries and benefits. So we can't continue to pull from reserves. We can't continue to defer capital projects that will and operational things that, that we have kind of put on the back burner for the last two years due to COVID. Um, there will be some municipalities that get really upset at 6.6 .6 or whatever the final number is, but I, I, I hesitate to limit considering uh, all the challenges that are ahead of us. Hopefully inflation doesn't go to double digit like many, if it was in the eighties when many of us can remember starting out and, and those things because our, but if you look out at what's going on in the world, not only locally, but worldwide, I think inflation uh, is, we're gonna see inflation that we haven't seen in 20 or 30 years in the next uh, four or five years. And, and we're just gonna to have to deal with it. So um, that's my position. I, I, even though I seconded it, I, I, and I certainly wanna hear Sandy, what Sandy's position is on this, but I, um, I hesitate to, to tie hand, uh, staff's hand to, to that number at this point. So that's my comments. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, Anna, you're next. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone uh, for the conversation. I, I know uh, when this came forward, I, I thought it was, a, I was leaning towards doing this for the main reason that it would be better to be cautious given that we do not know what the extent of the regulations are that still need to be addressed. But I have a number of concerns. And first of all, I appreciate staff's comments. This is really important. And one of the things I've heard from staff that, that the changes going forward is gonna, it's gonna cost us more money. It's that simple. And we're not getting the money through the grants. And I have a concern there. Uh, like municipalities that got uh, opportunities to get uh, money through COVID, CAs have not been able to do that. I don't understand why not, but given the challenges, it just doesn't make any sense that we would further go into a deficit um, 
it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So I, uh, I, 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 I'm glad to see that we're still going to, these are the early stages of the draft budget. We're still gonna have the conversations uh, and, and reviews around wages. I hear loud and clear that uh, the, um, we are controlling the expenses to the best of our ability. So I don't see why we would reduce our levy at the, at the moment. I think Christine said it at, right at the beginning, things may change as we go through this process. And I'm looking forward to seeing those changes. But for now, I am not uh, supporting the reduction in the levy. Great, thanks, Anna. Um, uh, Marie, you're next. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and thank you everyone for the discussion. I think it's been very, very helpful, uh, both from board members and from staff in understanding this. I mean, when I first looked at it, of course the 6.6 .6 number does seem rather high, um, but um, through this discussion, it does seem as if, uh, I mean, I've got a better understanding and I'm sure that as secrets municipalities, uh, that'll be explained as well. Uh, the question that I had is you're talking about the um, increased costs due to the changes by the province and the new regulations. Uh, how much, I mean, obviously some of that's gonna be like a one-time transitional cost, but where I'm getting a little confused is, are you looking at long-term increased costs or just that one-time change in, um, in transition? Tracy, you? Sure, I can answer that through the chair. Um, well, granted our transition period will be going through till January 1st, 2024. And at that point we'll have kind of the new process laid out through our agreements as well. So things that are through levy and compliant with the regulate, levy regulation, which we have not yet seen um, for those mandatory programs and services, but then those other programs and services that are delivered to municipalities based on agreement. So this will be a couple of years right now as we're transitioning through these new regulatory changes. And then the framework moving forward will be based on, you know, from I'm anticipating January 1st, 2024 forward. Um, and how uh, the levy regulation is changed at that time and how our agreements are worded for those programs and services um, required by our, our municipalities. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, because it's a question of kicking the, kicking the can down the road, right? So, um, okay, well, thank you for that. That does help. Okay, any other comments or questions? <clears throat> I just see Brian's <laughs> got back in, Alan. He's been right. in out a couple of times. So I don't know if um, you wanted to pick up anything that he was started, so. Okay, Brian, you're, are you there? Um, I'm just about ready to call the vote on this. There's no other hands or... Uh, or uh, you did, Brian. Wrap up, Alan. Okay, I don't see anyone else. Okay, so if there's no other questions or comments, we have um, a motion yeah. on the floor. Alan, can I speak to that motion? Go ahead, Sandy. To, to kind of wrap up. I mean, I think Marie just kind of hit the nail on the head on one part of what I was going to raise is that the 20, we're dealing with the 2022 budget. And the, as Tracy responded to Marie's question is a lot of those unknowns come after 2022. There's certainly one-time prep uh, issues that are in this budget. But also in the budget, when you look at the draft, there's a change, a reduction of $800,000 in contract revenue. We've had some really good returns on the investments we've had with Phillips Hager and North. Inflation is a big unknown. And I think as you has pointed out, depending on where you put the yardsticks, the number changes. And Part of the, the million dollars in change in wages, benefits, and per diems is based on the wage review that we agreed to last time, uh, last budget year. And the results of that are still an unknown. So I appreciate there's a lot of questions in terms of 
what are the changes going to be to the to the wage grid? And and I respect the the concerns that Christine has around, uh, you know, before depreciation expense, the kind of deficit we're running. But yeah, you know, the municipalities, as many times as we tell them, aren't going to care that we didn't get government support during COVID. They're just going to look at our number. And because of the change, you know, we're in a, the difficult problem is we've got to have a budget to go to the municipalities so they can set their budgets. And in the next four months, we're going to get some new information that will affect our final budget. But, you know, our final budget never seems to come down for the municipalities. So I, I really think the board should consider, and, and I don't want to direct staff to cut from here or add to that. I mean, that's their job. Ours is to give the overall direction. And I think 3.1 is a reasonable place to go to the municipalities with. It's going to be really hard to explain to the municipalities 6.6 .6 and the kinds of changes that we're making based on stuff that isn't going to happen until 2024. So uh, let's strongly encourage people to, to vote in favor of the amendment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sandy. So yeah, I think we've had some good discussion on this as to which um, one or two routes we can go and the amendment on the floor is that we go with the uh, 3.1% uh, increase in municipal levy. So I'm gonna call for the vote and uh, ask Michelle to do the roll, please. Marie Blosh. This is the vote on the amendment, right? This is on the amendment to direct staff to, to cut $200,000 in the levy and, and go for a 3.1% um, municipal levy increase. Okay, yeah, thank you, no. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? No. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? No. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? No. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Have we lost Brian again? I don't see him. No. Uh, no. Jim Raffle? No. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? No. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay. I have seven, seven. Is that correct? Is that what you have, Michelle? Yes. Okay, so it is a, a tie vote and a tie vote is lost. So um, the amendment has been lost. Um, let me just say though that uh, I think it's been a really good discussion today and certainly has um, given everyone an indication of where people are thinking and uh, staff can go from here and we'll, we'll, we'll pick this up again next month at our next, uh, our next look at the next version of the budget. And um, hopefully we'll end up somewhere between 6.6 .6 and 3.1. Um, and I appreciate it's, it's, a, it's really difficult because we're still in early stage. I think Paul said it very well when uh, he said that uh, Maybe it's a little bit too early to commit to a 3.1, but uh, hopefully we can, um, we'll see the 6.6 .6 number uh, decline. But um, um, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate your comments today and certainly given uh, the board and staff uh, lots to think about. So the motion on the amendment is defeated. Um, that takes us back to the original motion, which was moved by Mark and seconded by Alex. Um, 
that the board of directors approve the recommendation as presented in the report. Um, and we've had some discussion on that as well. So I'm going to call for the vote on that, uh, the original motion in the agenda. So Michelle, if you could do the roll, Alan, please. Alan, I see Brian had his hand up and oh. so did Anna. Sorry, um, Brian, go ahead. Um, yeah, and that's, I just wanted to make the comment that this is a draft and so we are gonna see things change. And so I think it's important that, um, I think it's a good point that Paul made up that if you or brought up that if uh, you know it, you commit to a number now, it, it can change. We may see things change for the better. So um, I think there's some very good justifiable points in this budget as to where it is right now. But the message can be it's not you know we're working on it, but it's uh, it's it's something that's fluid right now. Most municipalities should understand that because they're in the same. Most municipalities do not adopt the first budget draft that they ever see, so it changes. Okay, thank you. And Anna, would you, you had something as well? Yeah, my comments very similar to Brian's. Municipalities very seldom agree on, on the amount right off the bat. So I think this is a working document and looking forward to continuing this converse, conversation as we go forward. Yep. Okay, good, thank you. So again, we're back to the, uh, the original motion here. Um, does the board of directors approve the recommendation as presented in the report? And I'll ask Michelle to do the roll please for the vote. Mary Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Ann Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? No. Margaret Lupton? No. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? No. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Just yes. Just a point of, or point of order. Is this a, a weighted vote for the budget? No, okay, thank no, you. No, I, because we aren't actually dealing with the budget approval, it's just direction of the staff to begin to develop the budget. Okay. Um, so we, Anna Marie, so yeah, go back, go ahead, Michelle. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Raffel? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? No. Okay. Um, that is approved, that does carry. So again, thank you everyone. Appreciate the discussion and uh, certainly gives uh, staff, uh, I would maybe say clear direction, but certainly does give them indication of, of where the, the board's <coughs> thinking is and uh, gives them some, something to work on as we uh, continue through the budget process. So <clears throat> we'll move on to item 6.2. And this is the Provincial Offenses Act designations. Um, can I get Marie to move this and Anna to second it? So moved. I second. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I think that uh, we might have our, uh, our staff in attendance here for the meeting, but I'll turn it over to, uh, I'm not sure if, if Jen or Jenna want to say anything or want to introduce these folks. Yeah, you, Mr. Chair, I will like to introduce uh, Allison Miller. Allison, um, as through the report, you'll see she's been with us for a, a number of years. She comes with a, a great background in enforcement, especially with her um, auxiliary police experience and a definite asset to the Fanshawe team. Okay, that's great. Would Alice Any... mind turning on her camera so we can and saying hi so <laughs> everyone can see and put a face to a name? I've had the pleasure of working with Allison over the years and joint health and safety as well. So welcome back. Okay. Is my camera on? I can't see myself, but yep. <laughs> Allison is All right. there you are. There's well, Allison. Allison. I'm, I'm Allison, so it's nice to be a part of the meeting um, and to carry out employment in a full time capacity with the upper time. 
Well, that's great. Thank you very much. And yeah, certainly uh, glad to have you on board again. So uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. And then um, Jenna, do you want to? Yes. Through we you. already know Carrie, but if you want to introduce the staff <laughs> and talk about them. Sure. Yeah. No, I know most of the board is already familiar with Carrie and um, I'll just note that in May, Carrie marked 20 years with Upper Thames. Um, and a lot of you know her from her health and safety role, but she was working, um, she has been working sort of 50% health and safety and 50% in our planning and regulations unit um, as a regulations technician. So supporting our, our regulations officers. Um, and Carrie over the summer moved into our planning and regs unit in a full-time capacity. Um, and we updated her job description to planning assistant. So she's now um, assisting our regs officers in issuing kind of minor permits um, and processing some of our um, applications um, and, and supporting some of the, the review work that our regs officers are doing. Um, and so maybe I'll just get Carrie to say hello, and then I'll introduce you to Sergi. Hey everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a big change, but um, you know, so far it's been great, and I think it was a good decision. And we've got Jen, you know, taking over health and safety, so no concerns there that things are going to continue on the same way that they have been. So thanks, everyone. Good. Well, thank you, Carrie, and yeah, certainly um, to say twenty years. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Good to have you on staff. I know yeah, job descriptions change somewhat, but uh, um, it's good that it's a, a new challenge for you. And uh, you know, thanks for doing that. And we're looking forward to to uh, having you with part of our staff going forward. Great, thank you. Okay, so back to you, Jenna. Thanks. So um, our other uh, POA designation is Sarbjeet Singh. Um, and Sarbjeet just joined us on September 20th. Um, and he jumped right into two weeks of online Provincial Offenses Act officer training, uh, along with Carrie and Allison. Um, and Sarbjeet comes to us from the Lower Thames Conservation Authority, where he worked for three years, um, wearing a number of different hats, but working in a similar capacity um, supporting regulation staff. So he is our other regulations assistant. Um, and Sarjeet, do you have your camera on? Can you say a quick hello? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Sarjeet. I'm really excited to be here. Um, the staff has been really Recording helpful. Recording in progress. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Hello. Yep. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarji. And um, certainly, I mean, some employers are, are scrambling to find uh, staff, but it's, uh, it's great to find qualified staff. So uh, um, welcome to the Upper Thames. I know uh, our gain will be Lower Thames' loss, but um, we're, we're glad to have you with us. Okay, yeah. any uh, comments or questions at all from board members on this report? I'm not seeing any hands or any comments. So um, I'll call for the vote on this. Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Marie Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Raffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schattenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thank you to Jennifer and Jenna. And uh, once again, congratulations to Allison and Carrie and Sarjeet. And uh, best of luck, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Okay, the next item we have is 
And that's an update to the hearings guidelines for conducting hearings pursuant to section 28. And um, Tony's not with us. Can I get um, Paul to move that and Sandy to second it, please? So moved. Second. Okay, thank you. And um, so, of course, this is to do with the Conservation Authorities Act, the, the changes regarding the ministerial zoning orders. Um, so we still have to, um, you know, when we have a hearing, we have to grant permission, um, but we still have to have the hearing to determine any conditions that we might impose um, for the permit. So the hearings committee cannot refuse an application in this type of circumstance, but we, we can impose conditions. So uh, uh, Tracy, have I got that, uh, have I got that straight or you, anything you want to add to that? That's correct, uh, through the chair. Um, just wanted to highlight that, uh, yeah, it's kind of a lengthy document, so it makes up a big chunk of our, our, our package list today, but we've highlighted those areas that there's been uh, changes or additions and modifications. And uh, this document's consistent with Conservation Ontario's template document for conducting hearings as well. Um, Jenna, so we'll pass it over to you if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I think that that's a good summary, um, Tracy and, and Alan. I, yeah, we, um, with the board having to, uh, are being required um, to um, approve uh, applications that come forward as an and as as an MZO, um, the hearing guidelines obviously needed to be changed as well to reflect that. So there's a slightly different process that's been added to the guidelines now um, to acknowledge that. Okay, thanks, Jenna. Um, any comments or questions, at all from board members? I'm not, oh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, from the uh, chair through to, uh, I'm not sure if Tracy can answer the question to make sure, first of all, that this is the direction I should be asking the question, but I was wondering if our legal counsel or Grant Inglis had any kind of thoughts on, on sort of the legalities of the, of the province of Ontario to some degree, maybe even overstepping uh, a county planning department, let alone a, a conservation authority to be able to sort of uh, move something forward with a ministerial uh, zoning order as far as uh, what would seemingly be the, the logical way that, that the way it's been done versus the way it's somewhat maybe proposed uh, to possibly happen. It, it, it does seem a bit illogical when you have a, a hearings committee and you already know what the outcome is going to be in approval. So, uh, but um, anyway, Tracy, go ahead. <laughs> I, I would say generally as conservation authorities, we're, we're, we're struggling with the same dilemmas. Um, I can think of an example that was uh, being proposed, not in our watershed, thankfully, where it was an affordable housing complex proposed within a special policy area. Now, special policy areas in the province are special policy because they recognize that there may be some historical land uses in those areas that are entirely within the floodplain and recognize uh, wanting to keep the vitality of, of a community in place, but not wanting to see in residential intensification. So you can imagine a, a multi-story, multi-unit uh, affordable housing complex uh, kind of flying in the face of, of those policies. So uh, it was going to be uh, the recommendation of the hearings committee or to staff, uh, from staff to the hearings committee that the uh, proposal be required to have safe access. Um, so that's ingress and egress for people and vehicles during time of times of flooding. The challenge being that the condition that would be imposed um, would make it that it would require about, I think it was 1.8 meters of fill um, in order to achieve uh, safe access in those conditions. So uh, we are scratching our heads a little bit when there, there's some house, places where there really shouldn't be any permissions granted regardless of uh, the zoning order in, in, in effect. But uh, I certainly think Grant might have some opinions as well that he'd like to share. Um, I have opinions, but I'm not sure that they're worthwhile and, and will change anything at the moment. Um, I think, Tracy, you've summarized it we are all, we, the legal committee sitting out here kind of shaking its head. And uh, we, we don't, this is a legislative 
mandated uh, rezoning where your all municipalities ha have no say whatsoever. They can they can put these things in the middle of a river should they choose to do so. And I think until well, it, as Tracy has you know as usual very well explained it. Um, the authorities are left with trying to put in place with the conditions that we can attach until that gets to a court, because I think eventually the uh, authorities will put in place, as Tracy said, uh, this, this mandate, and then whoever has the zoning order uh, is going to take it for judicial review to a judge, hopefully, and then hopefully we'll get some judicial interpretation of this. You know, they, they've just done away with zoning and planning and everything. Whatever, whatever they want goes in. So I, I don't have any, I wish I had something bright to say, but Tracy said it all. Um, and I, I think that's where we're going to go. And, and we'll see what the courts say about it, but it hasn't gotten there yet. It has not gotten there yet. So. Um, it, it's really a travesty for, for uh, the local planning authorities and municipalities and cities. So we, we can do what we can do within the term of the legislation. But I think a judge is going to have to say something about this. Nobody's okay. taking it there. That's all. No, I no, appreciate that, Grant. Thank you. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, these things take time before they get to a court case and we get some ruling and some precedents done on these things so but no appreciate that uh mark any follow-up i'm fine okay thank you um and i've got marie as well marie yeah uh, thank you um yeah, i'm not going to say anything about municipal zoning orders uh i asked the other um change that that's jumped out at me was the attendance rule uh normal uh, our rule had been if someone left then that adjourned the meeting until they came back and now i see that if someone leaves the hearing can continue um and looking at the statutory powers act that's consistent but what it means is that there could just be one person making the decision and i'm wondering is that a change that we were required to make to be in compliance with the act or, um, I mean, it is a big change. And it, like I said, it does have a big, it has a big potential impact. Okay, um, Jenna, do you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, through you chair, uh, this was another change uh, put forward to us by Conservation Ontario. So it's one of the changes that they, that they made to their template guidelines. Um, certainly open to have some discussion with hearings committee members and the board about this. Um, it's something we can, we don't necessarily need to adopt. So I, the, the um, guidelines were, were updated and approved by Conservation Ontario Council at their September meeting. Um, and they're put forward to all of the conservation authorities for their review and, and, um, and revision to their own guidelines, but it's not, it's not required. So we can certainly make that decision ourselves. Okay, thanks. And yeah, we may have to uh, tweak some of these things a bit. I think if, uh, if certainly you had some internet issues and we were losing all sorts of committee members, uh, the chair would put in a, um, a break um, until you could either reestablish your committee members or you would have to um, conclude the meeting and, and reconvene at a later time. Um, yeah, that's uh, hopefully an, uh, an unforeseen um, extreme example, but uh, you're quite right, Marie. It is conceivable that you would suddenly uh, lose committee members during a hearing. Uh, if I could just jump in, I think that's um, for all meetings, whether they're in person or online. Okay. So it's just a big change going forward. Um, I'm not sure I think it's a great idea, but um, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. 
I guess through you, Chair, um, Michelle did note to me in the chat here too that the, the quorum, quorum would still stand despite that rule. Yes, yeah. So if, if you did start to lose more committee members, you would have to uh, you would have to adjourn the meeting until you reestablish quorum and you could, could carry on with the hearing. Well, if I could follow up on that, um, under, I did look at this at the act and it does specifically say that one person could be left and make the decision. So the quorum would then be just the one. Is that correct? Well, I'm, I guess it depends on, you know, in our case, we, we're looking at five members of the hearing committee. If we lost one, we'd still have four people there, presumably. Um, and we would still but what have if we lost all four? What if we lost four? Well, as soon as you lose quorum, you'd have to halt the proceedings and, uh, and try to reestablish uh, committee members or, or reconvene at a later time. Um, well, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's, I mean, I would rather deal with this now rather than in a hearing, it should it come up. Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe Grant has a thought on that because that sounds reasonable what you're saying, Alan, but at the same time, the act does say that one person can be making the decision. So okay, I, would it be the court? Would it be just as long as one person was left standing uh, the hearing could go forward and a decision made. I would think you would still need a, a quorum of committee members there, but uh, Grant, you have some, some thoughts well, on this? Alan and, and Marie, I, I think that that's a, a very valid suggestion that once quorum is lost, the meeting is adjourned until it can be uh, 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 reconstituted with a quorum in place. I mean, I don't think that's a hard change, um, but that would, Marie, protect against there being one person making the decision, which, you know, to me would, would lend to appeals uh, if the decision didn't go the way the applicant wanted it. Um, but I think that would be a very easy uh, amendment to make, that once quorum is lost, um, the, the, the meeting be adjourned until it can be reconstituted properly with a quorum in place. Okay, good. Thanks, Grant. Um, and Jenna, does that, I'm, I'm just trying to see where the, re the report here, where actually the wording is, but. Uh, it's, um, I think it was three point, and I lost it on my computer here, 3.3, I think. It is 3.3 .3 on page four. Okay, yeah, 3 .3. Thank you. Nancy, Nancy knows where it is too, so it's good. Good. There we go. And everybody's looking at their screen. Chris has found it here for us. Remaining members of the hearing committee can continue with the hearing and decision. So maybe we could just make, so it's clear, we'll, we'll just add a line in there to say that, you know, we must maintain quorum and if quorum is lost, um, then the meeting has to be adjourned until we can establish quorum again and continue on with the hearing. Does that sound acceptable to everyone? That way it's very clear. <laughs> you need yeah, I, like I, if I can, just one, one last comment. I, I, I'd be much happier with that because like I said, I think it makes sense to clear up that kind of ambiguity now rather than in the middle of a hearing. So, okay, I mean, hopefully thanks. it wouldn't arise, but I'd rather do that now. So that would make me happy. Okay, thanks. So Paul moved the motion and Sandy seconded it. Are you okay with that, that amendment to the wording that we just include that in there? Yeah, I'm okay with it. It clarifies a, a, an issue no. that we brought up. I am too. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Sandy. And thank you, Marie, for bringing that up. That's good, we'll keep it all clear. Um, O'Brien, you got a comment or question on this? Yeah, just following that line of, I'm a little concerned with the, the part being taken out where uh, members who haven't heard a decision and they come back, like they, it was that if, if not all the members were in, if somebody left, it would only be the dis people who were present for the whole hearing that made the decision. Um, that's been scratched out. Um, 
I'm a little concerned with that as well because if you don't have all the facts that were presented, how do you how do you make a a, a decision on the on the case? Um, well, I think it's still in the up the, the first line though. They must be present during the full course of the hearing. So I think that still applies that you have to be there for the full hearing in order to to uh, make a decision. It has crossed out who were present after the hearing member left can sit to the conclusion of the hearing. Well, that, that just seems redundant. Oh, okay. Um, if I may, yeah. it also in 3.4, when in dealing with adjournments, the second point speaks to any adjournments form part of the hearing record for electronic meetings. The board is not considered adjourned until any member departs due to technical issues for more than 15 minutes. So there is that 15 minute grace period there um, should they have technical difficulties and they're not truly adjourned. Yeah. And normally, yeah, we would, uh, if we're having connection issues, we would make sure that we would get people back in the meeting and um, yeah, 15 minutes is pretty generous. I think that's, that's good. And uh, the line is still in there about having um, committee members being present for the full course of the hearing. Okay. Any other questions or comments then on the, uh, on the motion as amended? Um, if not, I'll call for the vote on this. Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Marie Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Reffel? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, the next item is 6.4. It is 11 o'clock. I, I would propose that we just take a quick five minute break, um, give people a chance to um, go to the bathroom and, and maybe get a drink. And uh, let's, let's meet back in, in five minutes. And um, we've got a few reports yet to do. Hopefully uh, we haven't, won't take too much longer, but still um, a quick five minute break, please.
Okay, folks, um, that looks like it was about five minutes on my clock. So hopefully um, we've got everybody back at the meeting. Um, appreciate that. So the next item we have is uh, 6.4, and that is the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority's COVID-19 interim vaccination policy. Um, I'd also like to point out that, that Tony's not with us today, but Tony did send his thoughts on this item and circulated that to the board members. So hopefully everyone had a chance to read that. Um, and then the report is there as well. Uh, can I get Margaret to move it and Nancy to second it and we can have some discussion on this? Yes, I will so, so move. And I'll second. Great, thank you very much. Um, Tracy, do you have some initial comments before we open up for questions? Sure. Um, again, I just wanted to reiterate that this has been identified an interim policy kind of on grants advice. Um, certainly recognizing everything with COVID, uh, there's new announcements and new information and new science that uh, has been directing our decision making. And we have consistently relied on direction from the province, but also direction from our medical officer of health. And so the cover report, you can see, again, it's uh, referring back to uh, Chris Mackey, Dr. Chris Mackey's September 10th or September 3rd um, letter of recommendation that uh, this policy came about. And so far, you know, in anticipation for a type of policy moving forward, we've offered staff the opportunity um, to come in and, and and show their proof of vaccination either in person during designated time slots or, or via Zoom by holding it up to the camera. Um, so our HR team have been very instrumental in, in gathering that information. And I can say to date, 85% of our staff have, have uh, uh, been happy to comply and, um, and have actually shared quite eagerly <laughs> their, their vaccination status. So um, that's been good to see. Um, but I would say that comments from staff during this process, and you know, I've heard offline as well, many staff feel more comfortable knowing that those surrounding them are double vaccinated. So uh, again, when we look at policy of this type, we're looking at the health and safety of all employees and wanting to make sure that uh, all employees have a safe space to work. So uh, that's a little bit of background there for you. Um, I'm certain, certain Jennifer, uh, who's researched so much about this, uh, can answer some questions as well or provide some additional comment. Okay. Um, why don't I open up for questions first and then if, uh, if see what we had up here, we can either get yourself or, or Jennifer to answer. Um, Brian, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Uh, I support 95% of this policy. Um, I'm 100% in favor of getting vaccinated. I do truly believe it's the best way uh, to protect yourself and family and friends and coworkers. Um, the part I don't agree with is the disciplinary action up to termination for employees who do not get vaccinated. And the reason I don't agree with that is because there is debate still out there whether it's uh, legal to do that through employment law. I listened to a great discussion yesterday on the radio about that with different lawyers and it hasn't been tested in court. And so I feel that we could be putting the, uh, the conservation authority at legal liability by passing such something that's, that hasn't been tested. Um, again, I don't want to see anybody lose their employment. It's all about keeping people safe and uh, I'm fully in support of new hirings being vaccinated as well as promotions. That's a change in employment status. Um, issue that I think that I have is that none of the employees, this was not a, a, a terms of employment when it was brought forward when they were hired and now we're changing their employment. I know it's a health and safety thing, but there is still debate out there whether it's um, legal under employment law to terminate somebody by changing their terms of employment after they've been hired that they don't agree to. So I will leave that there and listen to some debate. Okay, thanks. Um, Jennifer, you have any comments in response to that? I don't, I probably def I I'd probably ask Grant maybe to comment on that sure. aspect of it, please. Sure, sure. Grant, do you uh, have a few words for us? I, 
Well, the, the, the very reason that, that we used the word interim is to allow um, for um, jurisprudence that might come down, legislation that might come down. Um, everybody, this is, is a bit of a um, crystal balling. And what the authority was trying to do at, the, at that piece, uh, which is at the end of paragraph five, I believe, um, is to give itself some options. And, and it, it, it was not gonna go nuclear right off the bat. Um, it it uh, gives the authority options. And, and that's what we were trying to accomplish until such time as the legislation until such time as there is legislation or jurisprudence or uh, whatever, getting any employment matter in front of the courts on this issue will be months, if not years from now. So that was what the authority was trying to do. It, it does not force the authority to uh, deem people unavailable for work and terminate them. They've given, there are three um, a, B, and C, and C being a rather um, wide open um, kind of concept to deal with the circumstance when it occurs, if it occurs, and in accordance with what the legislation may be or the jurisprudence may be, because we, we don't have any of that right now. So it's, it's a, an attempt to be very, to give the authority some flexibility in dealing with the issue. It, it does not mean that that person would be uh, terminated. Um, it, it does give the authority flexibility and that's why it was drafted in that fashion. Okay, good, thank you, Grant. Appreciate that. Um, other questions and comments? I got Anna next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been in and out of this me meeting, so I do apologize if uh, this has been uh, addressed already, but I did hear Grant talk about the interim uh, policy that's in front of us and wanting to know a little bit more what interim means. And I, I really do appreciate that given that we have options here to change our policy, given um, what it's gonna look like going forward. And I would anticipate changes coming um, in, in the near future, not only provincially, but um, as um, challenges occur on these policies. So uh, I wanna make sure, if, is that the only um, part of the interim policy is that it's just completely open to making changes is my question. Okay, um, Grant, through to you, you want to answer that? I think the whole, uh, my, interpretation and, and desire to use the word in interim was that the whole policy is open for uh, review depending on depending on what is going to occur in, in this very important uh, and polarizing uh, issue and and uh, you know we're waiting to hear what the judges say we're waiting to hear what the legislation says um, and and going going forward at the same time as trying to um, address the issue of looking after the majority of our staff and, and, and protecting their health because there is a duty that way as well. And, and uh, that's why it's framed in this fashion that um, the, the overall important point here is that we're trying to protect our staff as well. So I, I look at the whole policy as being open depending on or interim, interim, depending on what happens, what is going to happen in the future. Okay, thanks Grant. And I, I see Jennifer was nodding as well when we talked about um, the whole policy there. So um, Anna, any follow-up? Uh, no, I'm really glad to hear that. I do think it's important that the um, these policies are in place and having that flexibility is good to hear. I'm also very supportive of the education part of this policy. It's important how we educate staff and protecting the community as a whole. So thank you. Good, thank you. Um, Nancy. Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, just want to, um, first of all, thank the staff because certainly it appears a lot of work has gone into this report. Um, my question, I guess, is, is what, have we had any direction from Conservation Ontario as to what they're doing or even if other um, CAs, what are they doing as far as a, a COVID policy? Okay, Jen, any thoughts there? Actually, Tracy participated in the Conservation Ontario discussion. Okay. I can through the chair. Um, yes, this is an emerging issue with all CAs. Um, CAs, some are actually unionized environments as well. So the approaches they take are a little bit different. Um, but just uh, last Wednesday, Conservation Ontario hosted a, uh, a session for uh, anyone interested uh, among CAs uh, about vaccination policies. Um, and these are very much in line. Um, I know from speaking with a number of the GMs of adjacent CAs, um, you know, down at uh, Kettle Creek Conservation Authority, we've been uh, working quite collaboratively together with uh, Elizabeth there um, because uh, we wanna make sure that we have some consistencies and we are in the same public health regions as well. Um, Again, it comes back to your direction from your local medical officers of health. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to vary amongst areas too. So um, a one size fits all approach doesn't always fit um, when we're dealing with this virus um, and, and different uh, transmission rates, different occurrences uh, throughout the province too. So, Okay. Anything else, Nancy? Or No, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, Alex. Yeah, just um, I'm I'm a big advocate of getting vaccinated. I, I see the benefit of it for certain. Uh, I'm just wondering if there were alternatives um, like rapid testing and things that were considered, um, and are we equipped or avail or able to be able to do such a thing? Is uh, to provide. Um, an alternative for employees so that we don't have to resort to termination if there is a, a pushback. Just okay. curious. I, I know Tracy and I were, we did talk about that at one point. Uh, Tracy? Actually, I'm going to let Jennifer follow up on that one. I think she's got a little bit more of the research. Yeah, I mean, when we, when we drafted this policy, we left, definitely looked at all, all angles um, and what is available to us. Um, I think, as Grant has alluded to, we've left ourselves with a bit of an open um, in the event that we, we do come into um, a situation where, where somebody isn't vaccinated and, and according to the policy, um, doesn't have a bona fide reason for not being, being vaccinated. Um, and, I, and I think we just have to deal with those, those case by case, uh, I've looked into the um, section five talks about the rapid antigen testing, um, and we are eligible to receive such kits that people can take home and test themselves um, from home using. But um, yeah, I think that's that. Yeah, I think that answers your question. Does it, Alex? Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah, it, it certainly there is some consideration for that. So that's good. Um, Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm comfortable with the policy. I mean, when I look at the part about unvaccinated employees, it's you know four to five weeks. Uh, people have time to think about this, uh, consult with their uh, family doctor if they're concerned about vaccinations or you know, get the medical exemption from that uh, medical doctor. And really the, the situation that uh, Brian raised, if I understand section four correctly, really doesn't kick in until January, the end of January, 2022. So I'm not terribly uh, uh, uncomfortable with the policy being approved. Uh, Frankly, all policies are interim until they're changed anyway. The big question I have is, uh, why isn't the board included in this policy? I'm gonna let Tracy answer that one because we went back and forth on this one. <laughs> if I get 
through the chair, yes, there was some discussion about board being uh, included in the policy as well. But noting that uh, right now we're, we're not proposing any in-person meetings of our board, uh, number one, uh, until probably well after this, this timeline that's set out in this interim policy, uh, recognizing it is interim. And so that may change as we move into in-person meetings. But number three uh, is also, um, as board members, you're appointed by our member municipalities. Um, our recourse would be to notify a member municipality. Um, other than that, uh, because you're not uh, employees and it's not up to our, our uh, abilities to uh, you know, stop, uh, stop your um, appointments, then uh, it's really uh, a municipal responsibility we felt. But, uh, you know, that may change as we move. This is a policy for, for staff and volunteers as such. Um, but uh, as we progress through and start opening buildings and facilities back up to, uh, to more in, uh, in enclosed spaces, um, that, that may be a requirement for anyone entering our buildings uh, at this yeah. point. Uh, again, we're, we're looking at legislation as it comes out, uh, those high risk areas, seeing the announcement on Friday yeah. of the, the long term roadmap to uh, uh, proof of vaccination, vaccination certificates. Uh, all that will inform our policy as we make amendments as we go through the process. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One okay, more question. Thanks, Sandy. Um, yeah, certainly my municipality, we, uh, we included board or council members. Um, we're not meeting in person and we don't go to the township office, but uh, certainly as a uh, show of solidarity, uh, we included council members. Um, and yeah, once we start uh, meeting, you know, presume we start meeting again at the uh, conservation center, that's something we would... Uh, very much need to take a good look at because uh, we want everyone to be safe and everyone else working in the building. And uh, if you start having um, board members and um, contractors and different people entering the building who are not vaccinated, that's going to uh, be an unfair situation. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I got Brian again and I got Nancy. I was just going to say, Alan, Hugh's hand has been raised as well. Oh. Okay. Physically. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I back out of the screen. Go ahead, Hugh. Are you there, Hugh? Oh, yeah, I share. Uh, <laughs> yep, good. No, I share Brian's concerns about uh, people losing their jobs. And uh, I have a concern, too, about uh, basically you're making people... Uh, um, get a, an experimental medical procedure. Like none of this stuff has been approved except for uh, emergency use. And um, I have nothing against vaccines. I spent a pile of money through time on vaccines and I understand public health, but I still have a hard time forcing somebody to do something, uh, especially a medical procedure. And I agree, there's going to be an awful lot in the courts going forward about this. So as it as it is, I cannot support this. Okay, thanks, Hugh. Um, yeah, I've got Brian again. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, just to clarify my argument, I'm not. Uh, I actually think the best policy would not to have vaccinated unvaccinated people in the building. Uh, my concern is more with um, with the legal ramifications if we we were to terminate them for. Uh, un, not for being unvaccinated, um, and maybe this is my question to Grant. Just help me make me feel good about this. That we pass this policy, it goes to court and says you can't um, you can't terminate someone because they're unvaccinated. Uh, it's now been said that if it, they they would be terminated without cause or with cause, and then it comes back. Would we have to? Would they be able to sue us for um, severance on that situation if that went through? Are we covered with this policy? Like, how does this policy cover us? Is it because it's made in the time before the court decision was made? Or that's, that's, that's my only concern is I'm for vaccinations 100%. I'm just worried about 
the ramifications that if someone was uh, the legal ramifications of following through with this policy uh, going forward. Okay. Any thoughts there, Grant? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, as you said, you 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 listen to some it, it, the literature and the discussions about this are all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, if you follow, for example, Howard Levitt, who is an employee, a, a, a relatively well-known employment lawyer in Toronto, who is noted as an employee lawyer, he has been writing for some weeks that he believes that. Uh, a person who is unvaccinated can, can be terminated without any ramifications whatsoever on the employer because the employer's greater duty is to protect the greater number of people. Now, I, I, I'm not, you know, as I said earlier, all of that is still, a, do I think that this, the interim policy that we have here gives us flexibility? Yes. Um, the the uh, it, it, I'd love to be able to guarantee things to you, but one thing lawyers don't do is guarantee um, anything. So um, I think this this is a policy that is in the, the, the way it's been worded is to say that we would deem uh, we want all of our employees to be vaccinated. If you're refusing to get vaccinated, then it says we have the ability to, I'm not saying we would do, but we have the ability to say you're unavailable for work and the termination then results from the unavailability of being uh, for work. Now, now, that's just put there until we can see what happens. Do I think this protects us so far? Yes. Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the courts and I don't know what's going to happen with the legislature. These are obviously just even on our board, there, there are differing views about what should happen and what should not happen. So um, the, I, Jennifer and, and Tracy and everybody did a great job in trying to, trying to put a policy in place, which I believe will protect the authority uh, so far. Um, and then, going forward, seeing what's going to happen. Um, we, we don't know what's going to happen. And um, the, what, what's been drafted in here is, again, to provide you with flexibility and, and taking each case on its own merit. I mean, each one is different. And uh, I, 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 I feel that this is good so far, so far. I don't uh, talk to me in December, talk to me in January. Um, when, of course, when, when, it, when this gets in front of a court and, and a court of, of some, uh, you know, like a court of appeal or um, for the province, some high court, we'll see what happens. But I think that's going to be some time. I think it's going to be some time. So. OK, thanks, Grant. Um, Jim. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify a comment that was made uh, about the um, um, vaccines being only experimental. They were approved in 2020 for um, on an interim basis in order to um, initiate the rollout of vaccinations. But in September of this year, uh, Health Canada provided their full approval of the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines based on all of the science and information um, um, since the interim order had been initiated. So um, just wanted to clarify that point. Okay, thanks. Uh, and Joe. Uh, yes, uh, Grant really answered most of my questions. Uh, I was wondering about the employer's responsibility to keep everyone safe and uh, he did touch on that, so I'm okay. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we've had some good discussion on this, folks. It is a, a contentious issue and we could spend hours <laughs> debating this, but uh, I think staff have done a, a, a good job, a great job of putting something together. Um, you're never gonna satisfy 100% of the people on this, but I think this uh, this comes pretty close, so. Um, we have the, the report in front of us. 
And um, the motion's on the floor. It was moved by Margaret and seconded by Nancy. And uh, I'm gonna call for the vote. So uh, Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Mary Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? No. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Reffel? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay. So the motion does carry. Thank you. Um, and again, thanks to staff for all their, uh, you know, a lot of time and effort spent on, uh, on this issue. Uh, next item, we have a 6.5, and this is the frivolous and vexatious complaints and request policy. Um, can I get Hugh to move that and Paul to second it, please? Uh, so move. And second it. Good, thank you. And um, this is a bit of a, an item that uh, I think other, we've talked to other CAEs and they've been having some, do something here and good to have a policy in place. Um, that way we're protected um, when we get into a situation where we might uh, have a real issue on our hands. So I'm going to uh, get Tracy to make a few comments and I'm going to open up for some questions. And uh, Hugh's going to be first because I, I see his hand right now. So uh, Tracy, if you could just want to make a few comments first. Sure, just a few general comments is that uh, in practice, this is kind of the approach that we've been taking to some of these uh, clients that we serve that end up taking up a substantial amount of staff time. Um, so to have something that's a policy in place that gives further direction to staff um, it, it helps us to, to undertake that work. This is example of uh, a policy we, we kind of gathered from the, the town of Aurora. Um, there are other municipalities that have also implemented uh, uh, similar policies. I don't know if it's because of COVID or uh, people at home in front of their computers a lot more, but uh, we're seeing this type of behavior uh, escalating uh, and throughout all areas of our organization. Uh, I know Jenna was uh, great at compiling this uh, policy and pulling it together and getting feedback from, from all managers and, and staff as well. Uh, certainly, there, there may be a few more occurrences in, in, in planning and regulations that uh, have these types of issues, but uh, they're, like I say, there's certainly examples to draw from across the organization. So um, I know Grant also has been aware of some of these uh, frivolous and vexatious issues with other clients that he has uh, who are also CAs. Uh, and again, having that policy in place, uh, if there is an appeal to, um, under the Freedom of Information Act, um, helps the authority as well, uh, because there has been staff direction to substantiate what is considered frivolous or vexatious behavior. So hopefully that helps. I'm sure Jenna can add some more and uh, be available for any questions that you might have. Okay, that's great. Um, so Hugh, go ahead. Uh, no, thanks for that. Uh, you did uh, clear up a few things. Uh, so I assume that uh, uh, this is something that's um, within the last year and a half has got a lot worse than it used to be. And uh, just wondering, is it uh, a small number of people, uh, obviously, that are continuing to uh, uh, take up staff time? And you wouldn't have any kind of a clue about how much time something like all this stuff takes, would you? Uh, through the chair. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it would be great to have numbers. I can think of, you know, one individual, uh, their name pops into my head. Um, and I can think of a number of matters that this individual has spoken to almost every department within the organization because of uh, what they perceive to be issues. Um, and it's been going on for many, many years. Um, so again, I think I think this has ramped up a little bit. Some of the ones uh, of late, I think you see, you see it in social media as well. Um, people are more comfortable sitting behind a keyboard. So uh, their requests can 
just keep accumulating. Um, so again, I think their policy will help to deal with that. But as for uh, amount of time, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, certainly, uh, Jenna, if you have any other comments to add. Jenna, have you found any? What have you, what have you found out on this? Yeah, I can't estimate a, a time frame, but I would certainly note that the pandemic hasn't helped with the situation and having staff working from home. Um, we've been finding that individuals have been, um, you know, getting a hold of our staff directory and um, sending their complaints to multiple staff within the organization. So, you know, spanning various units. Um, and we end up spending a lot of staff time just in, you know, trying to um, track down, you know, who's been who's been contacted by an individual and, and following up with staff. And so it's it's a bit of a circus, you know, when we've got, you know, staff getting contacted kind of all over the organization. And it's not as simple as just walking over to someone's desk. Um, it involves phone calls and emailing and circling back and um, so it definitely compounds the problem working from home, um, where we're all trying to deal with a, a, the same complaint. And often staff are getting involved that don't have anything to do with um, the, the, the complaint in, in um, their normal role and responsibility. So um, just taking up a lot of staff time, certainly when we're already um, kind of maxed and, um, and, and sort of overrun with work already. Um, okay, good. Any, okay. any follow-up? Thank you. Uh, no, okay. thank you. That's good. Good, good. Um, Paul? Through you, Mr. Chair, and I had three questions, but Tracy answered two of them. So the only one left is, is there any sort of an appeal process for someone once they've had restrictions placed on them? Yes, um, through the chair. Yeah, I think with, with anything where there's a matter that has a policy associated, that policy provides direction to staff. And if there's someone that doesn't agree with the policy, uh, they can they can come to the board as a delegation and, and bring that matter forward. The intent is to kind of cir circle and keep those operational matters to, to staff. And, and if there's an occasion where it can't be dealt with in that, there is an opportunity to come back to the board. But, uh, Hopefully the, the policy provides enough direction to staff to, to assure them that uh, they're following policy, the direction given by board approval. And if I can just jump in, if you read through the policy, you'll see that um, we'll, we'll be setting a date for review of the restrictions that put, are put in place. So the, the, and that will be communicated to the individual. So um, there will be kind of a time frame established with it and, a, and an opportunity to review um, what, what's been put in place. Um, and certainly, yes, it, it, in the meantime, um, the individual can always appeal that through the board as a delegation. Okay. Thanks to both of you. And hopefully the board doesn't get involved in this. I, I certainly understand where you're coming from on this. Uh, my daughter's an emergency room nurse and she can attest that 10% of the people take up 90% of your time. So, um, I understand why you need this policy. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands. So with that, I'm gonna call for the vote then. Um, so Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Mary Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Ruffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried. Thank you. That takes us down to item number seven um, business for information. And the first one we have there is 7.1. Our administration enforcement section 28 status report. Um, can I get Brian to move that and Anna Marie to second it, please? So moved. So seconded. Okay, thank you. And um, this is one of Jenna's reports again. Jenna's, Jenna's been busy today. So uh, Jenna's available for any questions. 
Um, Mark, you're first. Yeah, from the chair, obviously through to uh, Jenna. What sort of things would you want as a procedure when somebody contacts us as a board member uh, to be able to sort of say, well, what's up with whatever, 132-21 Woodstock, Ontario, oops, that's the one I'm referring to, um, to be able to go forward to you to sort of say, well, in other words, I can't really answer the question to, to pass things along to you or do we, what, what, what kind of parameters or what kind of a, a game plan would you like us to do in cases? Yeah, and then I understand, sorry, through you, Chair, I, I understand this has been coming up more and more frequently recently. Um, and I, I think if you know the, the staff person involved in the file, um, if, it, if it's a, a permitting question and you know the regulations officer for the area, um, you can certainly forward through the um, correspondence to that individual and you can always circulate me as well is probably the best approach. And if you're not sure, um, then, then certainly circulate it to me and I can forward it through to the appropriate staff. Okay, good, thanks. Any other questions or comments on the section 28? Again, lots of activity going on and staff certainly have been busy with these, uh, these files, but uh, if there's no other questions or comments, I will call for the vote. Um, Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Mary Blosh? <clears throat> yes. Helen Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Reffel? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried, thank you. And thank you, Jenna. Appreciate that. Uh, next item, we have a 7.2, which is Conservation Authorities Act, phase one regulations update. Um, we've alluded to this a number of times in the last two meetings. So can I get uh, Joe to move it and uh, Jim to second it, please? So moved. I second that. Okay, thank you. And um, as I said, there's been a lot of discussion with this last few meetings. Uh, the, the province has now released these uh, these new regulations, and we, we did see some some very desirable results. We're glad to see that these uh, um, community advisory boards are not going to be required. And um, we did see some things like uh, passive recreation is now eligible under uh, a mandatory program. Um, but I'll turn it over to Tracy and she can uh, give us some more highlights. Tracy. Thank you. Through the chair, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that yes, there's these first phases of regulations that have been provided. Um, and this is really meant as an update. So I didn't go back to the original and, and talk about the changes to the CA Act and because many of those changes remain, um, the clarity has been provided through regulations. So, uh, as Alan noted, uh, the removal of the requirements for advisory boards was uh, certainly a one item that most CAs were quite happy to see uh, removed. Um, and those refinements of uh, what's included in mandatory and non-mandatory programs, that regulation uh, was something that we certainly were waiting to better understand our, our future budgeting process. Now, the work will be from now until uh, 2024 to uh, uh, adjust our, our programs and services to make sure that they're following into the different categories as laid out and obtaining agreements with municipalities to carry out those non-mandatory services. Um, the other point that I wanted to highlight is the timelines. So uh, in the past, the, the framework was to have everything in place by January 1st, 2023. Now this has bumped it out one year, one year longer. Um, as well as our uh, transition plan is still due at uh, the end of this year, but we have until the end of February 2022 to uh, provide an inventory of our programs and services to our municipalities and a little bit more clarity about what was involved. Uh, in the past, it was consulting. Uh, we weren't sure if that meant uh, 
a resolution from each municipality to confirm that they had seen it was necessary. But in this case, it kind of spells out a little bit more of the process uh, for providing that information to municipalities. So um, certainly provided a bit of an overview in the mandatory programs and services and our current statuses. Um, and uh, some things that we're really not sure of yet. Uh, just to highlight that uh, they're to be determined because uh, they had not been anticipated and there really hadn't been much discussion prior to the regulations release. So uh, as I had said in the, the budgeting discussions is that those areas will require further refinement discussion to, to determine what our work plan is and what will be required moving forward. So with that, um, again, the information's all there for a bit of an update and the final table provides those uh, prescribed dates for when uh, our deliverables are required to the province um, and we'll be working to achieve those those timelines. Uh, there's always some exceptions to allow for exempt, uh, for extending those timelines uh, with the province, but uh, I think our goal will be to try to uh, deliver upon those timelines. Okay. okay, thanks, Tracy. Any comments or questions at all from board members? I'm not seeing any hands at all. Um, Certainly we've been anticipating some news here and we've gotten it. So we certainly appreciate the update. Um, but if there's no comment, oh, Brian, go ahead, Brian. This one needs comment because it's, uh, staff have waited a long time for this. We've waited a long time for this. There's some, some clarity that's been brought out. I'm glad that the province through consultation did change some items and uh, they're for our benefit. Uh, so they're, they're starting, starting to listen, have been listening. Um, that's good. And they have given time to be able to, to meet some of these deadlines, which is also good. I don't think that, uh, I do still have concerns that we're going to run around, run around and everything's going to be the exact same in the end, but, uh, spend a lot of money for no reason. That's always been a concern of mine. Um, we're slowly getting there and, uh, yeah. We'll see what happens in the future when the next set of regulations comes out. Okay, thank you. And I'm not seeing any other comments or questions, so I will call for the vote on this. Uh, Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Marie Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Reffel? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried, thank you. Next item we have is 7.3, and that's the 2022 rental housing rates. Um, I could get Alex to move that and Mark to second it, please. So moved. I will second. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a short report, pretty straightforward. Um, we don't set the rates, it's the landlord tenant board. And um, there it is. Any comments or questions? Uh, Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, does the 1.2% guideline increase also apply to cottages? Is Alex uh, there or Tracy? Who wants to answer this? I can speak to that one if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Uh, yes, this does apply to the cottage program. Um, the fee that's directed by the province, or sorry, the increase that's directed by the province um, applies to anybody that falls under the Residential Tenancies Act. A related question, Mr. Chair, maybe not uh, appropriate for open session, but is there any, when will we be getting news if there is any on uh, the cottage matter? Any update there, Jennifer? Um, I'm sorry yeah. for dropping that on you. No, 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 you're not dropping it on me. I would I would say we should commit to an update in November. In closed session, please. 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to dealing with that at that time. Um, okay, so next we got Brian. Brian, are you there? There we go. Sorry, anybody knows me knows I'm not a fan of rent control, and this is why a 1.2% increase when inflationary rates are in the fives and fours and, and tax increases are way above that. This leads to how are you supposed to maintain a property correctly for the tenant when you can only uh, raise the revenue enough to not even cover inflationary rates or the cost of um, thing. But that's a different matter. It's not in our jurisdiction, but it is troubling and concerning um, when you can raise the rate $8 a month. That's not going to do too much maintenance, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any other comments or questions on this. So I will call for the vote. Um, Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Marie Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Raffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schadenberg? Yes. And Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried, thank you. Uh, takes us on to item number eight on the agenda and that's the FYI information report. And um, you recall the last meeting, Jim had a really good suggestion that we, we provide an overview of the September flood event and uh, talk about all the various activities that staff had to deal with. And so uh, there it is. We've got a really good report on, uh, on what took place during that, uh, that significant rainfall event. And um, we've, we're, we're still at it. There's been a lot of rain the last few weeks and uh, I, I had a picture of the, some water running through my, my pasture field a few weeks ago when this event happened. And uh, it, it's been happening intermittently ever since. I've had uh, various mornings where I wake up and uh, the water is flowing, the ground is saturated. And um, let's just hope things dry out a, a little bit before we, we do in, run into some more significant rainfall. But um, lots of good information there and uh, provides a good uh, recap of what took place. Um, Tracy, do you have any anything you want to uh, mention here in the FYI report? Um, yes, if I can through the chair, I was just going to highlight uh, what's scrolling on the screen right now, the Conservation Field Day. Um, I know uh, we had the day out in the springtime as well, um, during just prior to planting, and uh, now we'll be having this event uh, coming up. Um, so that is actually November 3rd. Um, and Brad had already indicated that this is message and invitation has been sent out. Uh, a few of our local councillors uh, have already confirmed their attendance. So, uh, yeah, we've got the warden of Middlesex uh, County, County and also the mayor of Middlesex, um, or sorry, deputy mayor of uh, Thames Centre. Uh, both are Middlesex County uh, representatives. So, um, wanted to extend the invitation to, to everyone here as well, because uh, I've had the an opportunity to go out and uh, see the site as well. And there's lots of innovative things happening there and it's good to see that on the ground work happening uh, to get a better feel of it and understanding. The FYI does a great overview and highlight of things, but to, to get out there and see it in person uh, is a great opportunity. So I'd encourage you to take part. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, uh, lots Hugh, of good information Hugh, there. Yeah, and Hugh has his hand raised as well. Okay, yep, Hugh, go ahead. Um, just a quick question. Do you feel you've got enough capacity if we get uh, a lot more rain that you've got a, like a, a, a fair degree of uh, ability to um, handle any rain? And uh, I would also, my second thing was I was out to the first conservation field day and it was really interesting and I encourage everybody to go and I will, I'll probably be there. Okay, thanks Hugh. Um, is Chris Tasker, maybe he would uh, be able to give us a bit of a, uh, a quick 
update as to how we're doing with, with uh, the rainfall and conditions right now? Sure. Um, I think uh, just in, in terms of update as far, as far as what we've received in the last uh, day and a bit, uh, we've seen 20 to 30 millimeters across the watershed. So that's got things pretty wet. Flows are rising. Um, and as far as capacity goes, really it depends on how much time we have before things dry out again, before we get more, more rain. You look in the in the forecast and uh, yeah, you see a couple days of, of not much rain and then, then some more rain in the forecast. Um, so really, I think in answer to the question about capacity, it's uh, across the watershed, um, it, things are pretty wet right now. So it's going, to, it's going to respond fairly quickly. As far as the reservoirs are concerned, Wildwood and Pittock are a little above um, seasonal levels uh, as we've been trying to get them back down to uh, seasonal, seasonal level, levels after the, uh, the September event and with the um, more minor events in between. Okay, thank you, Chris. Okay, yep, yep, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I'm not seeing other hands up at all. So uh, item number nine is other business. I don't have anything here at all, Tracy. Um, I think you, I was just, you had one item you were gonna mention. Yeah, I was just gonna mention if I can through the chair that uh, our, we're anticipating to bring forward our uh, final transition plan uh, next month um, so that uh, we're able to submit to the province by the end of the year. Um, Again, it'll be a fairly high level document just outlining the, the steps that we're gonna go through um, to complete uh, our negotiations with agreements and, uh, and timing of uh, the other deliverables. Uh, it would be nice to have a little bit more information, but uh, again, I think if we keep it more general, we can insert those, those details as they, uh, they're provided um, again and uh, continue to update it. Uh, as for that, uh, I think that's the only other item and uh, our closed session. We'll okay, follow. thanks, Tracy. Um, so the next item we have, number 10, is closed session. So we need a motion to go into closed session. Can I get Anna to move that and Marie to second it, please? I move. I second it. Okay, thank you. So we can... Call for the vote then. Uh, Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Mary Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Reffel? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schattenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried. So we will go into close. And we're back. Okay, so we're back into uh, open session for our meeting. Um, we had one item there in closed session, which was item 10.1. And can I get uh, Nancy to move and Margaret to second that staff be instructed to proceed in accordance with the direction issued in closed session. So moved. You only seconded. Okay, thank you very much. And we've had some good discussion on this, so I'm gonna call for the vote. And uh, Michelle, if you could do the roll, please. Mary Blosh? Yes. Alan Dale? Yes. Anna Hopkins? Yes. Sandy Levin? Yes. Margaret Lupton? Yes. Nancy Manning? Yes. Hugh McDermott? Yes. Paul Mitchell? Yes. Anna Marie Murray? Yes. Brian Petrie? Yes. Jim Raffle? Yes. Joe Salter? Yes. Mark Schattenberg? Yes. Alex Westman? Yes. Okay, that's carried. Appreciate that, folks. Uh, last item we have is item number 11, which is adjournment. And um, Hugh. Can you adjourn the meeting for us, please? I uh, so adjourn the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, folks. Appreciate it. Um, a long meeting, but a very productive one. 
lots of issues we got dealt with and uh, we'll look forward to uh, to continue discussion on the budget and other items at our November meeting. Uh, there is a finance and audit committee meeting right now. So if the uh, committee members could stay on the line here and we'll, uh, we'll figure out what we're doing here with the committee meeting. So again, everyone else, thank you, appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. And again, a quick reminder, um, November 3rd, if you have a chance, go out to Thorndale and see the uh, demonstration farm. Thanks, take care.